I'm uh, Frank Redzik from uh, Toronto Rehab and uh, the University of Toronto Computer Science Department. Uh, I'm very pleased to be moderating this um, event on the intersection of artificial intelligence, um, healthcare, and bioethics. Uh, before we begin, I want to say thank you to the organizers and the uh, sponsors. So, uh, Samantha Sandesi of Agewell, Anina Haikara, and Orbelina Cortez Barbosa of Computer Science uh, all contributed a great amount to the organization of this event. Um, and in fact, this is originally going to be just a small, tiny little event for the uh, students and postdocs within uh, Agewell, but it's since uh, grown slightly um, because of the kind of uh, interest in, in this intersection of, of topics. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to say a few words first, um, and then I'm going to introduce all of the panelists in order. Uh, and then each of them will say a few words uh, from their own perspectives on this intersection of healthcare, uh, technology, and ethics. And then we'll have an uh, open discussion uh, thereafter. Uh, so, um, to some extent, this conversation is taking place within advances in artificial intelligence in uh, other disciplines, most notably with regards to automobiles that can drive themselves now. Um, and uh, as soon as companies like Google and Tesla Motors started releasing data that showed that uh, self-driving cars could be uh, safer and cheaper and more effective than, than human driving cars, one of the first questions was whether or not um, professional drivers were even really going to be necessary anymore. Uh, and simultaneously, there's been a push from both academia and industry to, um, for an increased use of artificial intelligence in healthcare. Uh, and this has also stirred the public imagination to some extent. Um, across popular media, there are stories about AI systems that can support almost to the point of, of replacing uh, human doctors. Um, and interestingly, a few weeks ago, uh, Intentions Analytics released a survey of about 2,500 Canadians, in which 26% of us basically said that we would uh, prefer to have an automated system uh, replace our boss. We think automated systems would be more ethical and um, uh, more effective leaders than our bosses. So part of this might be the fact that we just don't like our bosses very much. Um, but part of it also is this new phenomenon that we're putting a lot of trust into, into computer systems. So um, that's the general public, but what do experts think? So Frey and Osborne of Oxford wrote a very well-researched um, study in 2013, which basically suggests that uh, medical practitioners are actually among the workers uh, least at risk from automation. So there's only a 2% likelihood, according to these individuals, of complete automation of the healthcare industry within the next 20 years. Um, other jobs are much more at risk, like, um, like professional drivers, for example, as illustrated in this um, uh, interactive page by the BBC. But by contrast, uh, the World Economic Forum put out a report in January of this year called The Future of Jobs, Employment, Skills, and Workforce Strategy for the Fourth Industrial Revolution, uh, which basically refers to the advent of artificial intelligence. And they have this graph which basically shows that they expect that although the skills required to be a healthcare professional in the next five years won't really change very much, um, the jobs outlook for these individuals in healthcare compared to other industries um, uh, is more at risk. So people will be starting to start losing their jobs or at least part of their jobs due to automation. And Vinod Kosla is a very famous entrepreneur and co-founder of Sun Microsystems who has been uh, investing very heavily in startup companies that are doing kind of artificial intelligence to support the decision process. Uh, he owns at least 20 companies or at least part of 20 companies in this space. And he suggests that technology will replace 80% uh, of what um, doctors do. The point is that there's some difference of opinion between experts as to whether or not um, uh, these systems will actually replace humans. Um, but, um, so maybe if they don't completely replace doctors in 20 years, maybe they should. So I was told um, that in order to have a lively panel, I should say something inflammatory or controversial uh, to start, so here it is. Um, to some extent, I'm playing the devil's advocate here. Um, but there's a lot of evidence that humans and other primates um, are just not very good handling information. Um, there's a lot of studies showing that patients have a lot of difficulty communicating to doctors uh, their symptoms. And another study which shows that nearly half of American adults have a great amount of difficulty understanding or acting upon health information from uh, their doctors. Um, so this isn't entirely the doctor's fault, but it is uh, an indication that there is uh, some interaction that could be optimized. Uh, humans also don't necessarily have the best possible brains. Um, so our memory fails us, our skills become obsolete. Uh, we have various uh, limitations on our time. Uh, and we have lots of cognitive biases uh, that machines don't have, including the recency bias. So in fact, there's a recent study uh, showing that diagnoses can actually correlate very highly uh, with uh, increases in advertising or media exposure to certain kinds of diseases. Uh, so if doctors see a disease being referenced a lot in the media, they're more likely to diagnose a set of symptoms with that uh, diagnosis. 
So uh, we're susceptible to mistakes that result in misdiagnoses. And in fact, a study by Winters et al. showed that misdiagnosis actually results in the death of over 40,000 uh, patients uh, only in intensive care every year in the United States. Uh, and above that, non-fatal diagnostic errors can also be very expensive for institutions and individuals who have to deal with malpractice claims. So where do these diagnostic errors come from? Uh, Graeber et al. Um, showed that in 100 cases involving internists, 65% uh, of diagnostic errors were due to system-related failures. So these are things like poor processes, uh, teamwork problems, miscommunication. But that 74% of these uh, misdiagnostic uh, or these diagnostic errors really came down to cognitive errors uh, by the doctors, usually involving prematurely closing a file. So um, obviously some cases can involve both uh, system-related and cognitive uh, functions. Uh, and in another study, just to hammer this point home, um, Eddie studied diagnostic error among surgeons. Um, he basically provided complete detailed case reports and asked, should the patient in this case report have a surgery? 50% uh, of these top surgeons said yes, and 50% of these top surgeons said no, which is basically no better than a coin toss. Um, and moreover, these same doctors, when were presented with exact same information just a few months later, completely changed their, their mind on what to do next, which is not an ideal situation when doctors are supposed to be making decisions based on facts and, and medical knowledge. Uh, they're not coins. Um, Bennett and Hauser actually showed um, that machines might be able to do better. Um, they compared patient outcomes between doctors and something called a sequential decision-making algorithm using 500 uh, random uh, patients. And they estimated the cost of these procedures proposed by AI were less than half as expensive as those uh, procedures uh, proposed by humans. And more importantly, uh, given what these researchers knew about these cases, um, the AI uh, processes resulted in 50% better outcomes than the human uh, decisions. And among similar lines, uh, the company Analytic showed um, CT scans of lungs to their in-house artificial intelligence software and to four top radiologists to diagnose cancer. Um, and basically, uh, humans made uh, more mistakes. Uh, they had a false negative rate of 7% to the AI's rate of 0%, uh, and a false positive rate of 66% to the uh, AI's 47%. So the point is that machines uh, can do better than humans, at least in some very um, limited domains. Um, they can even improve on human performance for some tasks, but realistically, in the very short term, uh, such systems will probably only be used in very limited domains. So these are two examples. Uh, modernizing medicine on the left, uh, they implement basic rudimentary information retrieval or search uh, from the data of about 3,500 providers and about 14 million patients uh, in order to recommend tests or drugs or therapies. Um, but this whole system is very deterministic. There's not much actual decision going on. It's basically just a fancy uh, index or lookup table. Uh, and uh, RP Vita on the right is a collaboration between InTouch Health and iRobot, the makers of the um, Roomba vacuum cleaning robot, um, which recently just received FDA approval. Um, so this includes uh, some speech recognition, some case-based reasoning, and some automatic navigation, which all requires artificial intelligence to some degree, but basically the system is not much more than just uh, Skype on, on wheels. So um, that's part of the reason why these systems are approved for, for marketing and for use, uh, because they don't really go that far beyond uh, what's already out there. But experimental AI of the type that we do in the lab um, basically can make lots of mistakes. In fact, we expect modern AI to make mistakes to some degree um, because the input that modern artificial intelligence systems have to deal with are usually full of uh, difficult decisions. They're very uh, noisy data or they're full of very ambiguous uh, input. And because there's so much possibility for error in these modern systems, uh, there are institutional barriers to their actual use. So if we actually want to uh, sell and use uh, these systems in the real world, they have to pass federal inspections um, and the approval processes. In the United States, the Food and Drug Administration basically is responsible for all medical devices, so you have to go through them if you're trying to get your medical device on the market. Uh, other jurisdictions like Canada have very similar um, systems. So apparently about 99% of new medical devices that are proposed for the market um, are relatively fast-tracked through um, um, something called um, a 510K, which is basically uh, if you can prove that your device is substantially similar to another device on the market, you can get your own device out uh, relatively quickly. Uh, unfortunately, things won't be so simple for artificial intelligence systems for which there's not really any precedent uh, on the market. And for those kinds of systems, um, you have to go through a much more uh, laborious process uh, called pre-market approval, in which the FDA basically decides if you're a class one device, which is something like dental floss, a class two device, which is something like acupuncture needles, or a class three device, which is something like um, a heart valve. 
so to deal with these problems that a lot of companies are having with trying to get their devices actually approved by the FDA, um, IBM has actually been lobbying for years to get uh, Congress and the Senate to um, uh, allow Watson to be used in healthcare settings. So Watson's basically this AI system that won Jeopardy about five years ago. Um, and the idea is that uh, Watson should be used by doctors because uh, the doctor is still the person who's making the final decision. Okay, so we, didn't, we shouldn't have to put a lot of regulation on these artificial intelligence systems because they're only used as support, like a chair. Um, so all this lobbying has actually paid off to some extent. There's a bill called HR6, the 21st Century Cares Act, or Cures Act, uh, which basically passed the House um, by a huge margin last year and has since been read twice in the Senate uh, and is going on to committee now. So um, if it turns out that the U.S. actually does make it a lot easier for companies like IBM to get their systems into the um, public sphere, this is where we have a lot of new ethical decisions we've never had to deal with before um, suddenly to deal with. So as an example, this is a one type of intelligence system being developed at the Toronto Rehabilitation Institute. Uh, this is the home lab, which is basically a recreation of a one-bedroom apartment in which engineers and scientists can test out technologies uh, that are designed to improve the quality of life for people, especially for older adults. Uh, and in the ceiling uh, is something called a fall detector. So there's a camera in it that watches you of every moment of the day. Um, and the AI behind the scenes basically tries to react if it thinks that you've fallen. So if the AI does detect a fall, uh, maybe you had a stroke, uh, for example, the system can ask you with speech if you need help or automatically call an ambulance uh, for you. So there's some issues with this. So if such a system would basically be recording you at all moments of the day, um, no matter what you're wearing or not wearing, um, it might uh, have access to your personal health information, like whether you're on some certain kind of medication that might have precipitated a fall. Uh, maybe it compares the way you've fallen against video from millions of other people in various states of undress um, to tell the difference between a stroke and a, and a fall due to a loss of balance. So if the system is to learn and improve who has access to the data, how accurate must a system be before it's acceptable for use in the home? Uh, if a system is to recommend a course of treatment, does it explicitly weigh some kind of measure between your own well-being and the cost to the hospital or healthcare system who is liable? Uh, these are just some of the questions that we're going to have to deal with um, and with which the panel will deal with in more depth uh, in a few moments. I'd like to introduce them to you. So from the left to the right, uh, Sally Bean received a BA in philosophy and English, an MA in bioethics and public policy and a law degree. She completed a fellowship in clinical and organizational ethics in 2007 through University of Toronto's Joint Center for Bioethics and received a senior ethics fellowship with the Trillium Health Center. Now she's an ethicist of, uh, policy and a policy advisor in Sunnybrook Hospital's Ethics Center where she provides clinical and organizational ethics support for patients, families, staff, and volunteers of the hospital. She's also a member of the University of Toronto Joint Center for Bioethics where she also teaches a graduate course. Uh, to her left is uh, Michael Brudno. He is the director of the Center for Computational Medicine at SickKids and an associate professor in computer science at the University of Toronto. Um, he has multiple degrees, mostly in computer science from Berkeley and Stanford, where he worked on genome alignments before moving on to become a postdoc at Berkeley and then a visiting scientist at MIT before starting his position uh, here in Toronto. Uh, Dr. Brudno's main research is in the development of computational methods for the analysis of genome uh, data sets. He is the recipient of the Ontario Early Researcher Award, the Sloan Fellowship, and the Canadian Outstanding Young Computer Scientist Award. To his left is George Sunil, a uh, manager of AI technology and R&D development at Artificial Intelligence and Medicine, which is a software engineering company in Toronto focused on the design, development, and deployment of information systems for healthcare, especially for cancer control. Uh, George is a technology leader with more than 20 years of experience in innovation, software development, team management, and business solutions in the medical and industrial fields. Uh, Graham Hurst is a professor of computer science at the University of Toronto. His research covers a range of topics in computational linguistics, including lexical semantics, the resolution of ambiguity in text, and the automatic analysis of discourse. His present research, uh, research includes the detecting markers of Alzheimer's disease and language. He is the editor of the Synthesis series of Human Language Technologies, the recipient of several awards for excellence in teaching, the elected past chair of the North American chapter of the Association for Computational Linguistics, and the current treasurer of that association. Uh, and finally, Ross Upshur is the Canada Research Chair in Primary Care Research and a professor in the Department of Family and Community Medicine and Dalalana School of Public Health at the University of Toronto. He is the former director of the University of Toronto's uh, Joint Centre for Bioethics and was a staff physician at the Sunnybrook Health Sciences Centre until 2013. He is a member of the Royal College of Physicians and Surgeons of Canada and the College of Family Physicians of Canada. 
He's currently the medical director of clinical research uh, at Bridgepoint Health, and his research includes uh, the intersection of primary care and public health, uh, especially with regards to the interrelationship between ethics and evidence. So uh, this is an amazing panel uh, in uh, all of our opinions. Uh, we're going to basically walk through uh, each of them in order, talking about their own perspectives on this intersection of, of uh, health, medicine, um, uh, technology, and ethics, starting with, with uh, Ms. Beam. Thank you so much. Uh, so I have the uh, dubious task of trying to, um, in about five minutes, provide an overview of the ethics and legal implications in AI. So I'll, I'll try to do my best um, to do that. In terms of the law piece, it's largely going to focus on the liability component, uh, who, who pays out essentially when something goes wrong, and then also the privacy and confidentiality aspects. Ethics, I'm going to zoom in a little bit more and talk mostly about the trust piece. And this is going to tie in nicely with what some of my co-panelists will speak about in terms of the trust relationship between, a, in particular, a clinician and their patient, and how that might be affected by the um, sphere in which they're interacting. So let's see. Do I advance with this, Frank? There we go. OK. So just briefly, in terms of the liability, AI really presents courts with unique legal challenges, um, very interesting emerging issues that we don't have case law or precedent on. And it often intersects with cyber law, which poses extremely complex jurisdictional issues. So imagine uh, someone in uh, Malaysia has advertised something in Canada, and there's a legal dispute in terms of uh, privacy, for example. And so you're dealing with international law, state law, all those types of things, and it can be a bit of a mess to sort out. So robots, for example, often uh, blur the line between people and instruments. So who's the agent doing it? Is it the surgeon using the instrument? Um, are we dealing with product liability in terms of the instrument? And so who shoulders or assumes the risk of mistakes? So when I say shoulders, essentially, who's going to be paying out if there is a tort? So if there's a civil wrong and something arises in which someone's harmed, who's going to pay the damages to compensate that individual? Or conversely, are we going to say to a patient or, or client, you're assuming the risk by uh, undertaking this, this particular treatment? So should it be a manufacturer, i.e. the user, uh, or, sorry, or the user, patient, seller, distributor, the instructor? Uh, maybe if a uh, instructor has taught other surgeons how to use a particular robotic surgical device, for example, and didn't teach them appropriately, or was negligent in their instructions, should they be sued? You could also think about a statutory exemption or a heightened negligence standard. So this is something that's done in the US for ski resorts, for example. If you can imagine, um, there has to be a heightened um, level of negligence before someone can recover because there's so many lawsuits for, for ski resorts. So it's actually built into the legislation. So there are lots of workarounds that you consider. And at a very basic level, to win a, to win a claim for negligence, you have to establish um, certainly that there was an injury, but that um, the individual that sustained the injury you had a, a duty to uh, either act or prevent that. There was a breach of that duty, and that there was a causation, and that your breach caused that injury. Very basic level, but uh, those are the elements that we'd have to prove. So OK, if we're in an area where there's not a whole lot of legislation or uh, precedent that we can work from, what are some of the transferable lessons from other areas? So as Frank was talking a little bit about, there's been a lot in the news in terms of the autonomous or driverless cars. So it really prompts the question, who is the driver in terms of the liability aspect in particular? So you know, very recently in the past couple of months in the US, the uh, National Highway Traffic Safety Administration issued clarification to Google that it will deem the computer software as a driver. So this is a pretty big deal that this came down. Um, and so essentially, that means that they can proceed and go forward. But of course, that does have liability implications, most likely. So there's been a lot in the popular media, and also in terms of intersecting with the ethics piece. So how should driverless cars be programmed to make life and death decisions? You might have seen headlines that say something to the effect of, you know, should driverless cars be programmed to kill? And they'll give the scenario of if, you know, someone coming up to a stopped car, they can't stop in time, group of six people on the left, a baby carriage on the right, you know, who do you hit? Uh, should you go for the baby because it's one person? 
should you hit the six people? So these very interesting ethical conundrums that many of you that have taken philosophy or have a background in that will recognize in, in other elements. Uh, but these are important questions. Uh, also the notion of how should it know when to break the law um, and, and anticipating those pieces. There's also the lethal autonomous weapon system. So this is something very interesting. It's, it's um, certainly th the most developments occurring in the US, the UK, and Israel. But it gets to the piece of who decides and acts. Uh, you're probably familiar with drones in which we have someone operating it, but what if there is no operator of that? It's, it's purely autonomous. So there is some international treaty work occurring on this right now in terms of um, there's the need for meaningful human control over targeting and engagement decisions. So essentially there needs to be a human pushing the button to say, yes, let's proceed. Um, so it is, it's very interesting in terms of are there activities that are inherently human, so to speak, that you require that momentary or instantaneous judgment and insight. And then the, another area that I think we can look to uh, is telemedicine and medical outsourcing. This is the area that I've done a little bit of, of research. So if, uh, if I'm getting an x-ray done here and my doctor uh, sends it to somewhere in India, for example, to have the x-ray read, because it's in the middle of the night and couldn't get a radiologist perhaps to read it. What are the implications of that? So how trustworthy are the individuals and the system that are supporting that? Do we have an appropriate information system that's sending my personal health information to India? Uh, what's the agreement there? And that's certainly the privacy and confidentiality concerns, and that really underlies a lot of the issues we'll be talking about today. Then, of course, promoting patient safety is the quality of whomever's going to be looking at it in another jurisdiction going to be comparable to what I might be able to access here. So shifting briefly into the ethics uh, realm, I'm really going to focus in on the trust element here. So this kind of builds on the telemedicine notion. So this is kind of something that I've argued. Uh, so to the extent that medical technologies Generally, I was saying telemedicine, but we can certainly use that in the AI context. So to the extent that it shifts or changes the traditional face-to-face -face point of care, um, telemedicine or robotics, et cetera, it necessarily alters the context of the traditional patient, um, physician-patient fiduciary relationship. So no, I, I don't mean to be alarmist about this and say that's necessarily a bad thing. Certainly not saying that, but it does alter that context. So I think we need to follow up and ask questions about what that means. So does the shift in context affect the relationship? Can we demonstrate that it does? Are any impacts positive, negative, or neutral? How can we mitigate any potential negative impacts if, if they do in fact exist? And so what's our comparator? Frank was getting to this a little bit earlier uh, in terms of talking about the professional race car driver. So do we want any technology that we use to be better than the best uh, surgeon? What's our comparator in terms of saying whether or not this is something that we should proceed with? And what lessons are transferable from other areas? So again, telemedicine, driverless cars, uh, what can we learn from, from other areas? So the trust piece, we could talk about this easily for quite some time on its own, but uh, I'll suffice it to say that there's really not um, a shared definition of what trust means. Uh, but there are a few areas of convergence in, in the literature, um, more so in the social science literature. So they'll argue that it's the outcome of behavior, something that, that is, is earned essentially and contingent upon the context, functions in relation to the person or object in which it is placed, must be continually maintained, and involves a degree of vulnerability due to the reliance. And a great example of that is if you're in a strange city and you know ask someone for directions, you're, you're trusting that they're going to tell you the right thing or the right information or that they, in fact, know how to direct you. So lots of interesting elements in terms of, of trust. There's also interpersonal trust. And of course, that's going to be between individuals. Um, and in the medical realm, positive correlations of uh, a good interpersonal therapeutic relationship include treatment adherence, a longer relationship with your physician, and perceived effectiveness of care. So lots of good things if you have a good trust relationship with your physician. 
Conversely, there are lots of negative correlations if that doesn't exist. Um, so you might have lower rates of care seeking, preventative services, and surgical interventions. And I'm sure if you think of either yourself or, or family members that have had a, a negative interaction with a, a physician, it, it certainly will say, yeah, you know, maybe I won't go back or maybe I won't follow up and that type of thing. It really uh, does significantly impact uh, individual decision making. And there's this broader system or organizational based trust. So this is broad in nature and refers to a collective. Now, often when you see, you know, polls in newspapers, it'll say, uh, "Do you trust the Canadian healthcare system?" And so they're talking broadly about this system or organizational based trust. Now, the interesting thing is that um, some of the research has, that has been done is that when you're asked that broad, abstract question you invoke notions of uh, individual clinicians. So if someone were to ask me, you know, Sally, what do you think of the Canadian healthcare system? I'm going to think about my relationship with my, uh, my GP, my family health doctor, and then extrapolate that. So use a bit of inductive logic and say, yeah, that's pretty good. I, I have a good sense about the system. So that means that the, that interpersonal relationship has very profound impacts if it is in fact that closely intertwined. So I think that's a really interesting connection to think about. Uh, it's um, so important because it uh, really influences our, our perception of the system level too. So what about transforming this fiduciary relationship? So it could be that we're transforming it into a more contractual or quasi-contractual relationship, and this is something that you're also probably seeing a lot in the media in terms of the shared economy with the Uber-type models. Just today I saw uh, in the paper about a gym that's pay per use, and, and these very short term, you know, non contractual, um, non long term contract deals that are more uh, in episodic in nature. So, you know, generally a contractual relationship in this sense, I, I just mean it in not an ongoing, it holds those parties to acts or forbearances, so to act or not to act or refrain from acting that you've agreed upon. And so a shift to contractual relationship you know, certainly could impact the nature of healthcare and basic conceptions of trust if it's viewed as this is just a one-off, it's nothing enduring. Uh, so it, it, it does shift the focus to a more episodic encounter versus an ongoing relationship. And again, this is not a slippery slope scenario at all. Uh, it's just one of those things we have to think about and say, you know, is that good or bad? How can we mitigate any potential negative implications if it does go that route? So what are, what are some of the uh, final additional considerations that I've been thinking about in terms of this? So, you know, examining, of course, emerging jurisprudence on the role of AI in medicine, lots of really interesting case laws coming out, mostly in the U.S. so far, uh, but that certainly can uh, give us a sense of where things are going to go here in Canada. Considering how can we foster scientific li literacy and accessible yet balanced discussions and risk of benefits in AI and medicine without fear-mongering, a lot of the popular media press, um, as Frank was showing you many of the headlines, they, they certainly create this alarmist notion that, oh my goodness, we're all going to be out of jobs, it's going to be, you know, the Jetsons and Rosie will be doing everything and, you know, that type of thing. It, it, it's very concerning how it's framed and I don't think that's a productive way to engage the public. I think we have to have a more balanced yet accessible way to discuss this with public members of the public. So examine how might the technology alter the context of the traditional face-to-face -face physician patient relationship. So think about what are those impacts and, and be quite honest about what they might be and, and certainly how we can mitigate any potential negative impacts. Um, identify best practices for enhancing transactional presence. So this is something that appears in the telemedicine literature in terms of positioning cameras uh, so that if a physician in, uh, we'll say, um, in Toronto is looking at a patient in rural on northern Ontario that there's still a good encounter. Now even the term transactional certainly denotes that it's very episodic in nature so I find that that interesting that that term's used. Uh, conduct research on the role of Im role and impact of trust in AI and medicine context. I think this would be a great area to partner and think about. And how can we support the productive integration of ethical analysis within AI developments in medicine um, so that it's not viewed as antithetical or oppositional to, to these developments, but thinking about it together instead of, you know, once it's gotten so far and, and then ethicists such as myself are saying, well, wait a second, did you think about this or that? So really produce a, a more collaborative endeavor. And I will stop there for now.
I'll give you something in the background, okay? It's okay? Sure. Okay. So um, I won't use slides. Uh, I'll just uh, tell you a little bit about the work that we do at the Center for Computational Medicine at uh, SickKids and also connected to the broader area of computer science and how you know, the use of technology is already uh, pervasive and the use of computer science is already really pervasive in medicine. And it really applies to all areas within computer science. So when uh, we start talking about analyzing genomics, genomic data, we start thinking about algorithms that can handle very large data sets. We have to think about databases to store the patient data and how to structure these so that information can be retrieved seamlessly. We need to think about uh, once we collect large amounts of data, uh, how we can encrypt them, how we can make uh, privacy aware decisions and the whole field of security comes in. Uh, when you collect very large data sets that can be samples of video in there, or it could be um, images for med medical imaging, x-rays, MRIs, and computer vision is a very important field in order to help uh, people I help one identify what are the most salient features of an image. And this goes on and on. So the field of computer, computational medicine really tries to take all of these aspects of computer science and somehow gel them together so that they're useful in the practice of medicine. And you think the way they're useful today is not so much, you know, we can look forward to this concept of a, you know, of a computer doing the, uh, doing the diagnostics and, and, uh, and prescribing you treatment. But today, these computers are already very much in use with a human in the AI loop, where the human actually enters some information into the computer and gets suggestions that can then be applied to the case, where the human doctor is actually the person who is responsible for all of the decisions. And, it, and the, that person is the one who bears all the legal risk, but the computer should be able to help, should be able to uh, save time or just you know help them s get to the right answer where it may not be obvious at first glance. So in our particular case, we work in the field of rare genetic disease. So rare diseases are uh, if there. You know you may first say, well, who cares about rare diseases? They're uh, v very infrequent. These are you know one in ten thousand people may have something like this, uh, and you know the overall you know, cost to the society may be reasonably small. Of course, there's a huge cost to the individual or the family that is involved with this rare disease. But actually, if you add up all the rare diseases together, you end up with a really large fraction of individuals who are impacted. So the total prevalence of all rare diseases together is somewhere like three or four percent. And that's actually quite significant. It means that a very large fraction, or a significant fraction of people will be impacted by a rare disease or will be impacted through one of their loved ones having a rare disease. Where the, just the reason is that the total number of rare diseases is extremely large. And when we're doing the, when we're working with rare diseases, it's very, we're very com often dealing with the case of not being able to diagnose a disease or not being able to diagnose the disease quickly. So patients refer to something called the diagnostic odyssey. Uh, and the, the reason it's called an odyssey is that just like the original odyssey, it may take 10 years. Uh, it's, I think the average expected time for a rare disease patient to get a diagnosis is on the order of seven years. This is the time it takes from the first symptoms that appear and they first go to their doctor. The doctor refers them to another doctor. That doctor refers them to a third doctor. They get tests done at each of these doctors. They get seen multiple times. They may get a misdiagnosis in the process. They will be told, you have this disease. And then after a while, the symptoms really don't stop, stop matching. So they will go back and it's like, oh, clearly it wasn't that. Well, let's keep going. They get you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of tests before they actually can stumble upon the right answer. And a key thing for finding the answer to these rare diseases, most of these diseases are genetic, meaning it's something in your DNA that causes you to have this disease. So what are we, how, the key to finding the diagnosis is to identify what it is in the DNA that made your, you know, the body, you know, the way it is. And to find this, we often need to have two patients with the disease. So we need to be able to say, here's one patient and here's another one. They have the exact same disease or the same constellation of symptoms. And then let's see what's common in terms of what's broken in their genetic code. 
So this requires us to be able to actually take two patient descriptions and match them to say that they actually have the same exact or the similar set of symptoms. How, does, would, how would we do this? Well, if we have free text descriptions, it actually becomes very, very difficult to do the matching because the free text is an extremely lossy way of explaining what is actually happening. It has lots of information, but information is very hard to match. Uh, so when we looked at the actual medical records at sick kids, we found 20 different textual ways that somebody could say that the patient had congenital malformations, which is basically just saying that they were born with something misplaced, you know, from a physical perspective on the body. Uh, and because they could say congenital malformations, they could say congenital anomaly, they could say multiple malformations, they could say multiple anomalies, and then you get into all the possible misspelling, all the possible abbreviations, and all the possible ways of actually combining all of those things. So that's sort of not surprising. So how do we go from all of these multitude of terms down to a reasonable description that we can actually match? And the key turned out to be it's effective software that allows you to start typing things and that gets matched to standardized terminologies and that's synonym aware and that actually uses some machine learning to map the synonym space and to map to the standardized terms that are used. It's sort of um, this problem of uh, having multiple diverse terms between the same thing. Actually, I was reminded by that by the example that Sally brought up, where it was, you know, if you're, you know, it's, 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 it's a, at the driver's exam, somebody asks is the other person, okay, you're dr going driving down the street, and on the left lane, you see, uh, you know, a crowd of people. On the middle, you see a big truck parked, and on the right, you see a baby carriage. What are you going to hit? And the person just hesitates and starts thinking, and the instructor says, hit the brakes. <laughs> so uh, it's, uh, so this is, uh, you know, this is this, this problem of um, terms meaning completely different things. Uh, it comes up with medical text a lot when you have phrases like, the, uh, the patient had trouble spelling. What does that mean? Well, it actually could mean dyslexia but there's actually very difficult to map the concept to the term. In a recent study, uh, they were trying to predict uh, what, uh, what the disease a patient had based on the electronic health record, the textual notes. For some diseases, very easy. Type one diabetes. If the word insulin appears anywhere in the medical record, you're almost 100% certain that the patient has had diabetes. On the other hand, dementia was uh, the accuracy was, I think, on the order of 70%, being able to predict whether a patient had dementia based on the medical record, because the description for dementia can be so vague. So uh, getting these actual symptoms into a standardized terms that we can then do the matching on was a, a key f uh, step in enabling something called the matchmaker exchange, which is a consortia of multiple sites who are all collecting data about rare disease patients and then exchanging this de-identified data, sort of saying, I have a patient who looks like this. They have you know, microcephaly, meaning small head, you know, epileptic seizures, and a whole bunch of other things, and the mutation in this gene on their genome. Do you have anybody similar? And then the other system could respond with the, uh, with the answer and say, yeah, we do. And then the actual clinicians get into the picture then and start talking to each other and decide, is that a valid match? Is that really the diagnosis for these two patients? And this system has already been uh, used to diagnose, I think, on the order of 50 uh, new diseases. So it's really being used successfully around the world right now. So as a final sort of part of what I want to talk about, uh, I wanted to connect this whole area of uh, using genetics to help identify the disease to the area of privacy and to the area of, uh, to the question of whether you consider your genome to actually be information about you that's private that you would want to keep sensitive. And just as a sort of quick show of hands, how many of you think that the genome is something that's you know, private and sensitive and you don't want it shared? Eh, about half the room. Uh, well, there was a interesting, there's a couple of interesting studies that recently happened, recently in the last five years, that uh, sort of questioned that whole paradigm. One was a, st a study in Iceland where a company, Decode Genetics, decided to figure out the genomic sequence of everybody in the country. 
The problem was that they didn't really decide to figure out the genome of everybody in the country. It was also everybody who ever lived in the country. So they got permission from some fraction of the population, there was a significant fraction, I think on the order of 30 or 40 percent, to sequence their genomes, to identify what are some key biomarkers in their DNA. But then for everybody else, they used publicly available genealogy records in order to figure out what their genomes were. It kind of makes sense. If I have the DNA of your parents and your kids, I can probably figure out your DNA. And they even figured out the, what the genomes for people who looked long time ago, what they look like, from whom they never got any consent to get at their genomes. So the Iceland Supreme Court actually shut them down. Uh, you know, said that this is not a study that you can ethically run because you didn't get consent. But they, all, they got consent from everybody from whom they got DNA. For everybody else, they just imputed this information. And uh, so this was a big controversy, and it's really not clear how to handle that. How, you know, uh, in the case of, for example, twins, which are identical twins, which is the simplest case, can one twin consent to the broad public sharing of your genome, of their genome, if the other twin does not? And because that information is going to obviously just let you know everything about the other one. And the other case was, again, a recent paper where uh, and this showed really the power of computer science, where the NIH posted aggregate information about genetic diseases online, which was something like, at this position in the genome, people with the disease had 52 percent of them had A's and 48 percent had T's, but without the disease it was 50 percent had A's and, 40, and 50 percent had T's. So basically, very broad statistics for you know, something on the order of a million positions across the genome, what was the distribution of people with the disease versus without the disease. And a graduate student at UCLA figured out that if I, they knew the genome of an individual, they could test if they participated in the study or not by looking for the shift at all of, across all of the positions. The information at every single one of the positions is tiny. But once you aggregate over a million positions, it actually becomes significant enough that you can identify in the, whether somebody participated in the study or not. And that led uh, the NIH to take all of that data offline, which then on the flip side caused all sorts of issues for scientists who wanted to study these changes to identify the causes of disease. You could not get access to it. So there needs to be this balance struck between the privacy of individuals and the uh, ability to, uh, of science to go forward. And that's actually a balance that I don't think we have completely worked out in the field of uh, genomics. All right? Thanks. Thank you. I'm going to talk to you. Uh, about some examples of actual real working expert systems or systems based on AI uh, in medicine. I've been doing this for quite a while. Um, 1988, I did an AI fellowship with Digital Equipment Corporation. And uh, essentially for the last 15 or so years, the last two MDS labs in AIM is uh, my experience in the medical area. So the first thing I want to talk is about uh, when you go to the doctor and you get a blood sample taken, it goes to a lab, and historically a lab technician would run the analysis, decide whether it's a good sample. Um, <clears throat> maybe it needs a repeat because it's at the limits of the processor of the uh, analyzer, or there's an underlying condition that they have to run further tests to uh, confirm before they send it back to the physician, and this takes some time. MDS had uh, an automated laboratory, which means there's conveyor belts and uh, it takes, a, a router takes it to the various analyzers. And when the analysis is done, there's an expert system that actually reviews this data and decides what to do about it. This system uh, processes 60,000 samples a day just in Ontario. And it's really the decisions are being made by an expert system. Not many people realize this. So that's one example. Uh, certainly, to process 60,000 samples a day manually, you need a lot of people and a lot of, a lot of machines. So the next, the next one is uh, kind of fits into the last talk. Electronic cancer reporting. Um, sorry, can't see the screen here. Typically, uh, 
cancer, uh, incidents of cancer have to be reported, be reported to a cancer registrar. And uh, these jurisdictions are all over the world, North America, Canada, US, Australia. And certain types of cancers have to be reported, other types aren't. For example, in Australia, squamous cell cancers or basal cell cancers of the skin generally aren't reportable because they're out in the sun a lot, so it happens. Uh, however, if the squamous cell cancer is in the mucosa under the nose or the lip, it has to be reported. So there's some complex rules as to what kinds of cancers have to be reported and what aren't. The people that do this kind of thing are called cancer registrars, and they go through uh, quite a bit of training to be able to read and interpret path reports and decide whether uh, the report or that patient is a, is a cancer patient and whether he should be reported to the registry. Unfortunately, reading a free text cancer report is a uh, it takes time, so it might take uh, five, five or eight minutes to actually read this report and decide whether it's a cancer. Uh, our, <clears throat> our system called EPATH, which stands for Electronic Pathology, actually scans these reports um, and it does so in the background. There's an NLP component that uh, interprets free text into standardized nomenclature, ICD-03 coding. Kind of touch on what you said, there's lots of ways that they say things, and it gets even worse, they get creative with tables, with tabs, and tumor summary, and there's a whole bunch of information there, so the system has to know that that information really belongs to the tumor, because it's in a tumor table. Uh, the system is context sensitive, it identifies negation, uh, et cetera, and then there's a rule system that examines the codes in terms of the class of the report. So for straight cancer, it's either negative or positive. Uh, we also extend this to central nervous system uh, reports of the CNS, and the classifications extend to a little deeper, whether it's a history of cancer, uh, metastatic, positive previously known, or positive new. And this does this in real time. Um, and roughly 14 million reports are processed uh, in the US alone through this system automatically. Uh, cancer appears in about 10% of path reports, so that means that 90% do not have to be reviewed by human. And out of those 10%, they have to be uh, abstracted, so human has to read it and do other things with it. <clears throat> the accuracy of the system, uh, this is a recent uh, study we did with National Cancer Institute on various sites, and we see that the sensitivity and specificity is quite high in terms of identifying whether it's a reportable cancer or not. And we know for a fact that humans do not perform at this level because when we do the QC studies, uh, so a QC study consists of 1,500 reports that gets arbitrated by a human registrar, and they decide whether it's a cancer or not, and then our system decides whether it's a cancer or not. Where there's a disagreement, we kind of look at it and decide, is the system wrong? Uh, what happened? Almost all the time, the human mis misapplied the rules, uh, or they did some interpretation incorrectly. So it turns out the system is consistent and it's right. Uh, we don't have a measure of how accurate the human is, but we know it's not this high. And in fact, we have these uh, sites installed all over the place, uh, including Australia, which is not on this map. So for example, in Ontario, <clears throat> if you go get a pathology report and they take a piece out of you, chances are our system will be reading that report and deciding whether it goes to the cancer registry or not. The same with the sample of your blood. Another system, uh, we call it RCA, Rapid Case Ascertainment. So this system does more than decide whether it's a cancer or not. It actually converts the free text into standardized data. And data is searchable for studies and trials. Um, it, it's used for automated candidate identification and notification. It can work with historical as well as current re reports. So if you have a database of 10 years worth of stuff, you can pump it into the system and it'll actually convert it. And, excuse me. <clears throat> Review of the system in, in the field shows that there are several different ways it can be used, and it actually significantly improves uh, throughput of reports and, and things for clinical trials. The system works something like this. So here's an example of a pathology report. Sorry, you can't really read it. Lots of information, tons of information, expressed in all sorts of ways. And the RCA system will actually produce this. Uh, it will extract the data based on a checklist, and different sites in cancer have different data elements required in the checklist. For example, this is a, uh, looks like a breast report. And so the synoptic elements for a breast report are defined by the College of American Pathologists. And, uh, and generally the data has to be filled in as such. Alluding to the former speaker's uh, 
comment about the best way to do it is to have a system that automatically, sorry, automatically converts the data into a standardized form while they're typing it in. That's great, and they've been trying to do that, but you have a lot of pathologists who will not use a computer system, and they insist on doing free text narrative reports. So we're stuck with this problem for a while at least. The system also allows you to do a quick check. So if you click on any value, it shows you where it came from. And the system's actually in use, and uh, just a schematic of how it's used. Reports come in automatically to the registry. The synoptic loader converts it, stores it in. Automated search service actually fires out notifications, and uh, a researcher can get notified every day, every hour, once, once a week of patients that are coming in in real time, and it's up to him whether he wants to contact that, that patient uh, for further, further study. Uh, an example of this, McMaster <coughs> University study in conjunction with the uh, Cancer Care Ontario uh, had a need to assess the reporting of HER2 uh, biomarker information in breast reports over the course of uh, two years, I believe. And they were looking for how often are these elements reported. Uh, so they had six students in three months' time to do this. Um, not really practical. So we uh, applied our system and we helped them go through. And th the idea here is that uh, when the data was extracted, the students had to verify that the data was correct. And so even without training and cancer registration, the system pointed to where the text, the data was, and they were able to verify quickly. So it reduced uh, the time required to scan a report uh, by six times. So they were able to complete the study. Another study, the National Cancer Institute wanted to find out <clears throat> how often TNM values are reported in cancer staging. T stands for tuner, uh, tumor, N stands for uh, nodes, and M for metastases. So they were moving from a collaborative staging uh, system to a TNM staging. So they needed to get some data on how often this is reported. So the system does something like this. It sees that clunk of text over there, and it figures out what it's talking about. Uh, the primary stage, the nodes, number of regional lymph nodes, et cetera. And so this allowed them to go through uh, a number of reports and identify how often the data is reported. Um, in some cases, it's not too bad. In colon, for example, uh, in some cases, it's pretty, pretty poor uh, breast metastases, 46%. So they're able to determine in real life how often this data is actually in the reports and whether it makes sense to uh, use these reports for the TNM staging. Uh, here's another one. Emory University um, had a clinical trial. They had to accrue 500 patients by 2013. Um, and so they came to us with the system and we implemented the system for them. They were, allow they were allowed to put the study in of the requirements, so they needed a, a mail with uh, certain types of, uh, doesn't say on there, uh, certain kind of prostate cancer and various other things. And uh, they were able to, and this is a quote, uh, able to finish uh, the study almost a year ahead of schedule with the system, but just found the patients on the fly. Big data machine learning. Uh, speaking about Watson, um, the US Department of Energy, and this is brand new, hot off the press, so. Uh, U.S. Department of Energy approached SEER, who's the uh, Agency for Surveillance Epidem Epidemiology and, and Results. Uh, they kind of run the large cancer um, sort of monitoring in, in the uh, U.S. So they, uh, U.S. approached SEER and said, well, you guys have a lot of cancer data. Uh, the idea is to let's develop some machine learning software that can use that data and build models and see what we can come up with. Uh, millions of reports. Uh, it turns out that big text is not big data. Uh, it, we need training sets. So they came to us and asked us to collaborate uh, with our tools to help them build uh, these training sets, so convert the text into standardized data um, and also collaborate on the project. And this talks about privacy issues. 10 million path reports, um, I bet not one of those uh, gave consent for uh, uh, taking part in a machine learning study. So there's issues with uh, IRB is the uh, internal review board that, uh, that will give you permission to use data for certain things or not. And HIPAA regulations come in the way. 
So that's me. Thank you. Thank you. So I'm talking about doctor-patient communication when the doctor is a computer. Communication in clinical settings is very difficult for people. Generally speaking, patients don't find it easy to talk with a doctor. The doctor's an authority figure. The situation may be stressful. The patient doesn't have a medical vocabulary for the message that they need to convey, especially in the doctor's language if it's not the patient's native language. And the message itself may be vague or uncertain. The doctor doesn't always seem to understand, and they talk back in medical language. They give important instructions or advice only orally, and they allow very little time for questions or clarifications. But doctors don't have it any better. The patients come in with vague and confusing stories. They use terminology wrongly. They don't understand much of what the doctor says, even when the doctor tries to express it in lay terms. And the patient then forgets most of it the moment that they leave. So all of this leads to obvious problems in quality of health care. So the question here is whether we can improve on this situation with artificial intelligence. Can we give our computer doctors superior communication skills that will contribute to an improvement in health care? I'll talk about some of the challenges to doing this. The first thing we need to think about is, well, how would a patient doctor communicate, sorry, how would a patient consult with a computer doctor anyway? What would the interaction be like? The title of this event, The Robot Will See You Now, and the picture on the posters suggests a scenario much like present-day clinical visits, except that the doctor is literally replaced by a robot or some kind of robotic installation that can perform even physical examinations. Well, that kind of embodiment is clearly a long way off yet, so let's think of simpler scenarios. And one that we can easily imagine for the near future omits the robot completely and hence any direct physical interaction, the doctor is embodied simply as AI software that's accessed over the internet through a regular device like a phone or a tablet or a desktop or a laptop computer. The input methods that are potentially available would be speech and typing in the device's camera. The output methods available would be speech and sound, text and images. So what kind of interaction can a patient have with this kind of a doctor? First, speech is pretty easy and natural for a typical patient in a real or a virtual office visit. So we can implement it for many different languages so that the patient can speak in whatever language is most comfortable for them. But obviously this will require highly accurate speech recognition by the computer. And as we all know from using Siri or Cortana or their friends, our speech recognition systems aren't nearly good enough to yet to support this. And they won't be for quite some time to come. So while we wait for that to happen, perhaps we might want to use the keyboard and the trackpad. That should make it a bit easier for the computer to understand the patient, and the patient can input typed language, perhaps along with some clicking of checkboxes or pull-down lists. Nonetheless, we have to remember that not everyone is facile with a keyboard, or with grammar or spelling, or with typing more than 140 characters without suffering from mental exhaustion. So with either speech or typing, what would a consultation with an AI doctor be like, and how would patients respond to such a doctor? When they're asked, what brings you here today, would patients answer in the same way as they would with a human doctor, which can be anything from a curt problem statement, my arm hurts, to a long disquisition of the problem and its history and its context? Or would they talk or type to it in keywords, um, not whole sentences, much as we do for Google or Siri? spots, rash, can't sleep. Much is going to depend on the exact form of the software and the kind of language that the doctor itself uses, including the extent to which the doctor's questions and statements allow the patient to give open-ended answers in statements in response. Could a system really cope with answers to open-ended questions to the patient, like, what brings you here today? Or, how does that feel? Or, how's your relationship with your partner? No matter how much the software constrains the patient's responses, there'll still be the problem of occasional or probably frequent misunderstanding, both the computer misunderstanding the patient and the patient misunderstanding the computer. As I noted earlier, doctor-patient conversations are pretty difficult when uh, the parties are both human. Um, 
and can only get worse when one party is a, doc, is, a, is a computer with inherently imperfect language skills. But one skill humans have, which we don't normally even notice, is the ability to detect when a conversation goes off track, when there's a misunderstanding, and figure out exactly what's gone wrong and say the right thing to get the conversation back on track again. So it'll be all the more important that our linguistically imperfect computer doctors have the ability to do this too, and to recognize when patients are doing it for them. And models of recognition and repair of misunderstanding have in fact been one of our topics of research here. We also need to think how computer vision fits in here. The system can't perform physical examinations, but it can at least see things through the camera. So it can say, please hold your arm up to the camera so that I can see the rash, for example. And if patients know that the doctor is able to use vision, then gestures will naturally go along with their speech as patients point and demonstrate problems using what are called deictic expressions. It hurts here. It hurts when I move my arm like this. For output, the software can use linguistic conversation when it wants to, but it also has the options to display pictures and video and to construct clear and highly personalized information handouts and instruction takeaways for the patient, ones that are not just assembled from templates but extensively tailored to the patient. And that's another research topic that we've worked on here. An AI doctor, as I've just described it, a software that we access on a regular device like a tablet or laptop computer, doesn't require any new hardware and it can be used anywhere. If and when we solve the considerable problems of speech and language processing and interface design in general, and the AI becomes good enough to communicate more or less as well as a human doctor can, it could be as good in communication as present day telemedicine consultations. But can we look forward to AI that communicates even better than a human doctor? Well, at least in some ways, yes. I've already mentioned two benefits. The first was multilinguality, offering consultations in a wide variety of languages. And the second was multimodality for both input and output. And a third benefit is infinite time and patience. There's no need for a rushed 10 minute consultation. Our AI doctor can interact with the patient for as long as necessary until understanding and full purpose is achieved on both sides. So to summarize, handling the kind of sophisticated language and conversation that happens in doctor-patient communication is one of the hardest problems in artificial intelligence. But solving these problems would add a new dimension to AI and medicine, direct communication with the end user, the patient. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. It's a real pleasure to be here. And I represent the community that's to be replaced, as I'm a practicing physician. And I was really struck uh, uh, by the claim that 80% of my work uh, will be gone. And I'm really keen to find out what 80% is going to be. And uh, interestingly enough, so just picking up on the, on, the, on the last presentation, how many people in this room have not entered symptoms into Google for either a problem that they've had themselves or somebody that they know has had. So two people are not Google doctors. So it's, it's interesting. So when I started as a physician, uh, I was a, a rural family physician. I worked in a small farming community to the sort of northwest of here. And anybody who knows anything about farmers is that during harvest season, the last place they want to be sitting is across the desk in your office. And they tend to be a very taciturn lot. In other words, uh, back to the whole idea of putting their symptoms into language and finding that common interpretive space so I understand what ails them and I've got a good idea of what I need to do takes some time. But at least after that exercise, I had it in their words and we had an agreement upon the meaning and a way to go. What I found interesting over the last five to 10 years is that patients now come to me, they've already Googled their symptoms, they've already made their diagnosis, and they have their output and they hand it to me and say, it's all right, Dr. Upshur, I've saved you all the work. I've got, 
X. And it's usually some completely uh, obscure one of your rare diseases that came up, you know, but, but, you know, my left ear feels warm on Tuesdays, my right eye flickers frequently, and I have this funny crick in my knee when I move it up and down. And they'll put it in and they'll get a diagnosis. You put anything into Google, you'll get a diagnosis. But they've got the diagnosis. My job is just to give them the treatment that Dr. Oz told them they need for this constellation of of things. So, so the, there's a kind of mixed blessing uh, to the advent of, I would say, big data computational possibilities. Yes, in some ways it might save time, but despite the fact that when I started in a very low-tech environment, when I first started uh, in practice, no, there were no computers in offices. Uh, if I wanted to find an article, I had to use the old Index Medicus, look it up, and then walk to the stacks and pull it out to find it. I couldn't just Google a PDF. I'm not certain that I spend any less time now uh, or that any time has been saved in my day-to-day -day life. And in fact, if we don't get these systems very well specified, and they're perfectly specified in more deterministic systems, but where I work in primary care, which is kind of lots of ambiguous language, lots of vague symptoms that may in fact turn out to be one of the rare diseases, but in their early pre-differentiated phase, uh, all look kind of alike. But so it's not actually saving me money. I spend more time now undiagnosing people uh, because they've all, and then convincing them that they don't have the disease they think they have because they found it. And clearly, a computer has to be more intelligent than you, Dr. Upshur, despite the fact that I've had 30 years clinical experience. And certain general rules of thumb and heuristics, yes, as humans, we are uh, uh, subject to cognitive biases, but certain, bias, or certain heuristics uh, still work. Common things are common and uh, particularly in primary care. And so that kind of flies in the face of the kind of wide interpretive uh, net that's cast with search engines. So I think there are some particular hazards and there actually have been, I think, uh, adverse consequences associated with, so with the use of computer technology for self-diagnosis. And that's gonna become more and more common. And I joke with my residents, I say, you're gonna be replaced in, in, in my lifetime. I'll be retired. Fortunately, you'll have to deal with all of the new whole genome sequencing and soon basically you will be responsible for your own diagnosis. So the Canadian Mal, you know, the Malpractice Association will be out of business. Why? Because everybody's going to be their own doctor. They will Google, they will put into some text thing, and we'll need a point of care technology, right? So you'll wake up in the morning and you'll have this warm feeling in your earlobe and a flickering eyelid and a cricky knee, and you'll think, I need to self-diagnose this. So you'll, you'll, you'll put that into your, your system, and then you can have a point of care technology with a drop of blood and it will run off, you know, multiple sequential tests and tell you whether everything, the state of affairs is good. Then you go to your sort of drive through MRI and sort of get like your whole body thing and it'll all take this together and it will tell you on your own basis what's wrong with you and then you're responsible for the results. So all of the issues around the liability, the fiduciary responsibility, since it's your own equipment and you're doing it for yourself, you will have the responsibility of it. So 80% of my work may be gone, but nonetheless, the responsibility for the accuracy of diagnosis, the accuracy of therapy, uh, therapeutic decision makings, has to reside somewhere. And so what I often say to my residents is that you know physicians are, 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 are physicians not because they necessarily are more intelligent than other individuals in society and having taught for 30 years, uh, I'm not sure that's the case. I think there are many intelligent people uh, more intelligent than physicians. It's because they're actually willing to take responsibility uh, for the decisions and the diagnosis they make. When somebody comes to you as a patient, yes, there's all the difficulties of mediating language and uncertainty and interpretation, but it's the fiduciary element. It's the idea that I will be the one that takes responsibility for making the diagnosis and how things actually work out. And it's, I find it hard to think of a, regi a regime whereby responsibility is displaced onto some 
into the cloud. I, I loved uh, Sally's example. So you've got a Malay, you're, you've done your diagnosis, but the company that, that you've run it through is in Malaysia, and they don't have any sort of uh, interoperability with the regimens in Canada. You're, you're out of luck. So one thing I would make sure of for all of you future self-doctors is that you really read those agreements that are 60 pages before you click I agree and then use it for yourself. So the other problem is that I think where these issues are best suited is in fields that are, so this is me, before I went into medicine I used to teach logic. And so where you have a finite field and, and combinatorially a simple, you know, you can reduce it to a deterministic system, that's where a lot of things can be routinized and, may, and, and they will work and they will work well. And I think that's the area where, where a lot of judgment and clinical judgment will be replaced. So one of the best things I've seen, for example, uh, in my career is automatic electrocardiogram reports. Uh, they're, you know, instead of me looking and sort of saying, oh, is the ST segment depressed? They actually can give you with fair accuracy uh, whether there's ischemia or arrhythmia or something wrong with the heart on the electrocardiogram. And that's actually been useful and helpful. But because there's only so much information, the, the signal to noise ratio is actually uh, been uh, fairly well contained. But in the, where I work in primary care, I think it's going to be incredibly difficult to actually put all of that into some sort of finite field that you can actually reduce the, inter I think you'll be successful at reducing some of the interpretive variability, but nonetheless there's going to be a requirement somewhere for someone to be outside of that system to be making interpretations. So I think there's a lot of promise. I don't think it's going to actually replace humans. Uh, I would be happy to have 80% of my work that I choose taken away from me. As long as I have some choice of which 80% it is and which 20% I retain, I think that it, it, it will not be so problematic. But I think uh, the promise is still way more uh, than what the reality is. And I'm uh, going to be really happy to see what happens in the next 10, 15 years uh, to push this along, whether we will actually. I would love to have the kind of uh, software that you were just talking about. That would be awesome. Uh, and some of the stuff that you guys are talking about is actually showing where the promise lies. But I think we're a long way from it being uh, replacing a, a general physician. Uh, but we'll see. I could be entirely wrong about that. So that's what I have to say. Thank you. Uh, so uh, we have some time uh, before we have to clean out the desk for the class that's coming in after us uh, for questions. Uh, some of you have provided questions on the online registration form when you registered for the event, uh, but I'm sure some of you uh, here have questions also. Uh, we don't have a microphone that we can run around, but it's a relatively small room, so maybe if you do have questions, you can just yell it out um, and we'll try to hear you. For any of the wonderful panelists you just heard amazing stuff from. possibility. Uh, machine learning al algorithms can do things that look like intuition, um, but they're really just logic and, and building models from examples. So it's possible um, to what extent and to what extent it'll be accepted. I'm not sure, but I, I think that's, that kind of thing's possible for sure. 
So t to me, a lot of it depends on whether you're a, a determinist or an indeterminist. If you believe in a fully deterministic universe, and many people in precision medicine, in fact, there was an article in JAMA where they were saying, there will be a time when we will know all the permutations and combinations of every possible illness and its genetic origins, in which case that you will have then the capacity for an algorithmic reduction and you'll have perfect diagnoses. Uh, but those of us from the logic side of things remember that there's, a, you know, all Always this problem about incompleteness, and so there's always a small amount of indeterminism and fallibilism in any system. Uh, so we might be asymptotically reducing the error space, but we're never going to. It's ineliminable, as far as I can see. So I think it's actually a social construct rather than a scientific one. Uh, you know, uh, computers can replace uh, medical doctors when the society trusts them you know, at the pretty much the same level as they trust their medical doctor. It's not, it has nothing to do with are they more accurate or are they less accurate. Uh, but by that logic, Google has already replaced the doctor. Yeah. And to a large extent they have? To some extent they have. I have a question, actually. So we have a bunch of, of questions from shy people um, who don't want to ask the questions that they put online. So 100% um, so of my work is going to be gone then. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's 100% of the work for 5% of the people that yeah. you see. <laughs> uh, so, so some of the questions involved uh, startups. So I wonder if possibly some people in the audience are interested in creating companies in the space of artificial intelligence and medicine. And I'm just curious to follow up on the idea that maybe there's some kind of filter that can be placed between Google in the short term and doctors so that, I mean, before we have the drive through MRI machines, if there's some kind of uh, role or some kind of output or some kind of system that can be put in place that can filter the output from Google so these individuals can be more informed and not uninformed by junk science and Dr. Oz and stuff. Do you think it's an idea for us, like, like a company, to be developing a filter of that type? No? You want to hear it? Um, it's, it's possible. <laughs> <laughs> it's a question of regulation, right? If you're if you're considered a uh, by FDA to be a you know a medical device and you have to be licensed like a medical device, it's going to be very difficult. If it's for entertainment purposes only, you know, go on WebMD today and enter your symptoms. It'll work. Mm. Well, let me come in here. We see almost imperceptible changes as Google gets better, but over the years we know it gets better. Mm -hmm. So more and more it's not just returning documents to us to do with them what we want, um, it's returning knowledge extracted from the documents and that comes up to possibly at the top of the screen. It's chosen the exact right paragraph from Wikipedia or from some other document that Google believes it can trust and it returns that to you going on incrementally, I think we'll start to see ever more um, knowledge synthesis happening in Google and its counterparts themselves. So in that way, Google will be doing a little bit more of the work for you, but it will be, as Mike says, still for entertainment purposes only, at least in the legal disclaimer, how that, what that will mean for the behavior of patients and whether they choose to consult uh, the medical system or not would remain to be seen. But to get to this question with regard to startups, I don't know if there's a space for a startup there, but certainly for existing technology companies that have the resource to do this sort of thing, there's a lot of space to move and grow. Yep. So this is, excuse me, uh, going back sort of to the 80-20 uh, of uh, my job. So as the present and, and future of medical technology development, um, what should we be aiming for as sort of an ideal? What 80% should we, would you like us to take away? And what 20% would you like to keep? Or do you think that you should keep? Uh, that's a great question. So uh, the 80% I'd like to take away is the electronic medical record. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Which is uh, one of the, because it's, it's, so 
One of the interesting things about it's the practice of medicine, and, and, and people develop their own practice styles. And so the worst thing that ever happened to me was actually the advent of the electronic medical record. Because one, uh, I don't type very quickly. And I used to joke to my patients, I'd say, I want you to bring your laptop in so you can Skype me. Because I, so I can actually see what's on here, and then I could actually see you. And now, actually, it's, it really regiments and changes the uh, interaction between physicians and patients. The other thing they did is they allowed far too much free text in. And it's, uh, as a researcher, we had the same problem. You'd be astonished at the number of ways in which my colleagues can uh, put down type 2 diabetes into free text. We counted like 30 different ways. So what the 80 percent, so a lot of the, 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 the stuff that it really helps for clinicians is it and and it kind of levels the field is that you don't have to remember as much so when i went to medical school most of what you were trained was what required heroic feats of memorization and all sorts of mnemonics. We had to like remember where nerves went and where they didn't go. And now you don't need to remember that because just like you, almost every com place has a computer and you can pull up the, uh, the an anatomy. So it actually allows you, I think the 20% that you would like to keep is the meaningful relationship discussion. So, it's, so those first few slides were, were that, that you had up, you know, how, why are you here today uh, is a very simple question that, or how can I help you today, that admits to an almost infinite number of permutations. And that's the conversation dialogical dimension that I think is the essence of medicine. So the kind of routinized uh, differential diagnosis uh, that emerges from that, I think, can be aided by uh, 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 by computer. But I'm a I'm a primary care physician, so relationship is rather fundamental, and we can have those conversations over time as diseases become uh, very undifferentiated till they become differentiated, or as most uh, family physicians know, uh, go away on their <laughs> own. So self-limiting conditions are actually one of the most common reasons for people to consult family physicians and having that kind of judgment. And it's, it'd be very interesting to have a smart system that could say, uh, I've listened, you've, you've typed in your symptoms and we've got a few little biological parameters. You have a self-limiting condition that's going to go away on its own. Um, whether people would actually believe a machine telling them that they have something that's going to go away. So I would say the 80% is a lot of the memory work. Uh, that, and the 20 percent that to retain would be the relational work that I think is fundamental to medicine. Over here. Um, so this, this sense I get today from seeing these presentations, and forgive me and correct me if I misunderstood, the focus is on replacing the doctor with an AI system, but the model is still a patient goes to That's what you were on about. Because, well, uh, what, I, what I'm thinking is, I'm imagining uh, an AI system that's, that's broader than just focused on medicine. Uh, this AI system is just a constant companion to the user. Because, I mean, we can go to the doctor's office and we're asked for all our symptoms in this neat little package we give to the doctor. But I, I feel like the symptoms don't happen to us in this neat package. It kind of come up. Well, as I said, I posited a model yeah. where this thing is simply available over the internet anytime and anywhere you want it. And I did that with some reluctance, given the title, The Robot Will See You Now, mm. exactly because, as I was developing my talk, what came home to me over and over again was the importance of physical examination, of tests and other things that can happen, that have to happen with for the foreseeable future, a human physician or clinician of some kind. I mentioned telemedicine as a comparison where the physician might be far away and there's a nurse practitioner or something who's able to provide the hands to that physician. But I, I suspect that 
would make Ross unhappy because he sees the value, it emphasizes the value of the in-person aspects that go along with physical examination. But I think uh, I, I, I don't rule out the possibility of them being completely replaced in the model that I said at the beginning where you're your own physician. So you could actually go one step further and with your Fitbit it might have just a little you know, micrometer that takes little pipettes of your blood and if your DNA addicts get changed or something it would it would alert you immediately that you've increased your risk of carcinogenesis by 0.001 percent uh, so you could have actually daily dynamic sampling of your system there's no reason why I couldn't track your brain waves your uh, you know there's lots of ways you could wire yourself up to, but to go back and, uh, that, you know, whether human will remain in the AI loop, it's actually this year is 50 years since the first computer doctor. It's uh, 50 years since Eliza was first uh, came out. For those who don't know Eliza, Google her. Uh, it's, uh, and so it has been in your computers for 50 years. Uh, be a, a psychotherapist willing to talk to you and listen to all your problems. And actually, if you think about how far we've gone in these 50 years, it's actually not that far. We're, uh, you know, we're pretty close to the level of Eliza today. Still a long way to go before we get, the, you know, com completely human uh, out of the loop AI. And going back to the question of 80 to 20 percent, I think a lot of the work that we've done has been to figure out what is the 80 percent that the doctor is willing to cut. Mm. So electronic health records are horrible. And that's because they're horribly designed. Yeah, I know. And one of the things that, you know, when we work with clinicians, they, you know, came back with, there is very menial tasks that go into their job that they would love to get rid of. And computers are much better at, that, at those tasks than clinicians are. If they're properly If they're properly designed. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> On the topic of general AI, there was a paper in a JAMA Internal Medicine in it. So it goes back to sort of these, these chat bots, these conversational agents. And what they did is they had nine questions, some were mental health related to say suicide, for example, or depression, some were uh, related to rape. And so they asked a bunch of phones and a bunch of systems, so Siri, Cortana, Google Now. And they found the responses were like inadequate and inconsistent. And so they, they published this, which is good. And I think maybe a few weeks later, they, some of these systems have been fixed, but should that be like an earlier test case in the process that these chatbots get some basic education on how to respond, say, uh, giving a number for a suicide helpline? So do you think if that's the wrong steps where someone has to publish these mistakes first and then it gets fixed? Should it be a test case, for example? Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure that I, <clears throat> I think if anybody's applying a chatbot to a suicide prevention line, it's pretty irresponsible at this point. Um, I, so, yeah, so, there's, so the way it happens is, yeah, so they ask the phone, they would say to the phone, I want to commit suicide, and then they record the response of the, of the phone. So in some cases, it would respond with the phone number for a helpline, just like a Google search does. In some cases, it would give up no response or just send it the statement to a, a search engine. So, yeah, so, the, so what the office was saying is, yeah, it, it needs to be better in a lot of these cases. <laughs> Not responding to the user properly, and people are using the system. I mean, it's a question of what you expect the system to do. If you type, I want to commit suicide into Microsoft Word, you don't expect it to do anything, right? Uh, so it's, you know, is, you know, Cortana like more like Microsoft Word or more like talking to your doctor? And if you're talking to your doctor, you do expect your doctor to actually do something in that case. And, and it might come up with some, you know, Credible ways that you might want to do it. Yeah, right? you know? they, they come back with your. Yeah, yeah. Take, it on the websites. We do it. Take you to the book Final Exits about how yeah, to do it. <laughs> so we have time for one last question. Let me there respond <laughs> by sort of denying the question in a, in a, I hope, useful way. There is work in artificial intelligence right now 
in assisting people to make diagnoses and other arguments and eliminate their cognitive bias along the way. So while agreeing with the general spirit of your question, this is something that's been thought about, not just in the medical domain, but in legal reasoning and intelligence analysis, that is military intelligence analysis, and so on. It's research that is in its very early days, but it will certainly have an application in medicine in some time in the future and assist doctors in diagnosis. So there, there are strong cognitive biases in AI technologies. They're called overfitting. Hmm. So uh, if yeah. you have a better training set, that's uh, you know, always better. But uh, in general, your, any kind of machine learning technology is only as good as the data you yeah, gave to it. Somebody's got to enter on. the concepts in the first place. Okay. Yeah. OK, so that's all the time we have for today. That was an amazing talk, uh, a group of talks by everyone, and a lot of good questions. Uh, I hope. Uh, you all enjoyed it as much as I did. Uh, let's thank the uh, panelists for their time.